government, the province of North Holland in the Netherlands, and uh, he's going to tell us everything about his experience with Spatial BI. Well, thank you. So yeah, I'm working for the province of North Holland. That's the Netherlands, as you can see on the map. That's the, the area we're um, in charge of, as, uh, as to speak. There's about two and a half million people living there, over 55 municipalities. And we're responsible or involved in environmental uh, planning, public transport, cultural stuff and also uh, infrastructure network. Um, and that's where this talk will be, uh, be focusing on. We're managing uh, over 650 kilometers of roads, several uh, hundred kilometers of waterways, lots of uh, infrastructure like bridges, uh, viaducts, tunnels, and uh, lots of parks and, and trees as well. And our budget, just to give you a, a bit of a, uh, an idea for the next year, is the, and, uh, the 33 and the 28 million. Um, and even though that's, uh, well, it is a lot of money, we're still um, yeah, involved with budget cuts and, uh, and really looking at ways to, uh, to optimize the, the maintenance of our, uh, of our infrastructure. So a way to, uh, to optimize that is to really um, keep track of the, the quality and the status of the information uh, or, uh, of, the, of the infrastructure and to really keep an eye on when you actually need to, uh, to provide maintenance, do maintenance on your, uh, on your infrastructure. So that's kind of what the, the graphic there shows when you put your uh, your new infrastructure in place the the quality of it uh, is, it's really good and over the years it starts to deteriorate you'll want to do some uh, some maintenance at and in some point of time the end the the infrastructure is really uh, end of life cycle and you'll need to uh, replace it with new stuff um, so that's one thing we're looking at, really optimize the, the maintenance of it. The other really important thing to it is to minimize hindrance to the public. Um, so we don't want to break the roads open this month to put in new, uh, new pipes uh, for the sewer, for example, and then in two months' time do the whole thing again because you want to do some work on the trees or uh, the pavement or whatever. Um, so we're trying to cluster work in big batches every 12 years and uh, you'll have to weigh those two variables up against each other to, to find an optimum maintenance cycle. So if you look at how a lot of us are thinking about data modeling and uh, putting information about assets uh, in general in a database. It's often in terms of a, a relational model. There's a lot of standards in the, in the Netherlands in place. Um, that's an example, the IMGO data model. And below one is more from the infrastructure side and the Dutch Normalization Institute about a, a standard way of decomposing uh, viaducts and tunnels. Um, and while that's really good, it can make querying such databases uh, really complex. And if you then start look at other businesses, say McDonald's or Amazon, and look at how they are uh, structuring their data and how they are working with uh, business intelligence tools, they're really focusing on the, event, the events, the, the sales of a hamburger, for example, and they put that as a central fact in their data model and in so-called dimensions around it, they'll uh, structure the, the stuff you want to query about. So when did you say, sell that hamburger to who, what type, et cetera, et cetera. 
And one of my uh, assumptions or one of the things I wanted to research is whether we can use that event-based uh, focus on the data model for asset management as well, since that's really about those uh, events uh, as well. You're constructing your, your assets at a certain time, and then you're inspecting that, keep track of the quality every year. Um, and that if you start thinking about it that way, um, you can also mainly uh, of possibly use those business intelligence tools to query uh, your data. So one of the things that triggered me to, to look at it that way was the uh, Geospatial BI workshop back in 2009 at Phosphor G in Sydney where I attended. Um, so when this project came up in the last year, uh, yeah, I was really keen to, to explore how I could use uh, spatial BI concepts in, uh, in asset management. Um, so a quick look at our data architecture. We're starting with uh, the, 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 the large-scale to topography map, which is the, the base map uh, of the Netherlands. We're then augmenting that with asset information, so we don't just have the location of the roads or the trees, but also what type of tree it is, when uh, they last uh, clipped it, uh, when it was planted, etc., etc., and basically the same for all our infrastructure. Um, and while we're building that asset database uh, specifically for a lot of the, the, the infrastructure we're maintaining, we have several other databases with information about the public transport, for example, the punctuality of the, the bus trips, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, recognizing that you won't put everything in one central system, um, we're starting to build out this data warehouse where you can pull, pull in data from all those different systems. Um, and while, while you have that data warehouse, you can then start building data marts using this dimensional data model um, to actually look, use the, the BI tools to query your data and, and display it. So a specific use case to, to test those theories against um, are the waterways, where, as I mentioned in the second slide, we're maintaining quite a a lot of kilometers of waterways, and the actual maintenance of the, the canals, the structures on the sides of the canals is very expensive. Um, so if you can optimize that, there's a lot of gain uh, to be made there. So these are just some examples. Some of the, the constructions are of very good quality, um, but there is also parts that have been put in place like 30, 50 years ago, and really are starting to be, yeah, Oh, not of uh, not of good quality anymore. Um, so finding those places and deciding to optimize your uh, your maintenance on that uh, can be very cost effective. So again, if you typically think about how you structure that data in a relational model, um, you have here a part of a yeah, dam bond. Uh, a dam in uh, in place, a steel construct uh, uh, construction, and then this other part is uh, like stone uh, a stone wall, as you can see in the in the picture. Um, and then, if you want to uh, main or, or have your quality information, how good the, the quality of that part is. In a relational model, you typically have to uh, chop up your, uh, your record again in smaller bits and, uh, and pieces to keep referential integrity and uh, keep all the data. And if you do that years and years uh, in sequence, you end up with a very fractured uh, data set. So a whole different way of looking at that is to actually put the 
your quality inspections and the areas that you're, uh, you're observing as being of a, of a certain quality in that central fact table with the length of the, the quality that you're, uh, you're having there and the actual infrastructure in one of those dimensions. And that's maybe something I uh, explain here, that there's a certain system in place that scores the quality in ranges from A, where, where A is very good, to D, where D is, well, really bad, and you should uh, really, yeah, fix that. So those quality information, A, B, C, D, and the length of observed quality is going into the fact table, and then when you did that uh, observation is going into a dimension on which part of the, the construction you're observing is one of the dimensions, etc., etc. And if you then use uh, standard BI tools against those, uh, the, such, a, such a data model, you can really easily pull out numbers and uh, create graphs of your data where if you do that in a relational data model, you'd have joints upon joints upon joints on several tables to pull out all the data. So the pilot project um, we, uh, I did was involving uh, Pentaho, which is an open source BI suite. Um, which has uh, Mondrian as its OLAP engine and Kettle as its uh, ETL tool to load data into a, a data cube. And our geospatial uh, components to that uh, in the form of GeoMondrian and GeoKettle. Um, so that's the tools I, uh, I looked, uh, looked at, the technology I looked at to uh, to do, to do this pilot, and well, I'll come to the, the other one in a second. So Geomondrian is using uh, JTS and GML in the background to do a lot of the, the geo uh, processing and the, the interaction with uh, the, um, the, 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 the spatial relations. And while in small data sets that uh, sort of works in the, if you drop like 60,000 60, trees or uh, several hundred kilometers of uh, waterways into those data marts, it really, uh, yeah, had r a lot of performance problems and uh, a lot of memory problems in the Tomcat server. Um, and there is a, an issue that while Geomondrian has a lot of uh, capabilities for uh, for doing spatial relations in the in the OLAP cube. There is not really a nice user interface, a drag and drop user interface uh, that you can use with it as of yet. Um, and if you then look at uh, a non-strictly spatial user interface, and that's the the Saiku one that I. Uh, I started playing with. It's really lightweight. It has the, uh, a plain Mondrian OLAP engine embedded in it. It doesn't have the spatial functionality, but then if, you, uh, if you're smart enough in loading your data cube and pre-calculating your measures uh, in, the, in the data cube, that's actually preferable at, the, at this point in time for us over the, the Geomondrian uh, way of working. So this is a quick screen grab and it's actually a bit condensed so you might not see the, you're actually not seeing the left hand side. So let me break out of the video and just show it to you live. So this is that Saiku engine and that's querying one of those dimensional data models. Um, so in the drop down box here, I can choose one of my data marts. Um, and then 
I got my dimensions and my measures all on the left-hand side here. So I'm interested in a specific stretch of waterway. And then I'm interested in the, that quality, that ABCD in that area. And I like the total length of those quality uh, measures there. And I'd like to put that against uh, the years. So I have two years of inspections worth in this, uh, in this data model. And for 2012 and 2013, you'd have your quality measures over here and the total sum length of the, uh, the construction that's, uh, that's measured. And I can immediately switch over to uh, graphical uh, ways here as well um, with different sorts of graphics. So this, in the end, is a, is a very user-friendly way of interacting with your data and just drag and drop your measures and the dimensions you want to offset it against. Um, and during the data loading into the data mart, I actually intersected the length of the dimensions with the uh, measured quality. So you're pre-calculating, in a sense, your, uh, your spatial relations um, and not actually using them in the, the server. So to come to uh, conclusions, um, as I already said, that uh, the geomondrian at this point in time <coughs> has for us, for, the, to, for, the, for our means, uh, quite some limitations and it's more important for me to, to have a, a user-friendly UI that I can present to my end users and then do the, the spatial querying while I load the, the data cube. Um, and one of the reasons we can do that is because we do have those strong spatial relations in our data model so I can do the, the, the pre-calculation during loading of the, the cube. And the next thing so I, uh, I want to do is, while well, the, the graphics are really nice, um, I do want to have some, some geospatial capabilities there to actually then show those areas on the map as well. Um, and yeah, I've not started looking at that yet, but that's, uh, that's the road ahead for uh, for us. So that's all I wanted to tell you uh, today. Any questions? questions. Saiku is open source, yeah. It's, uh, okay, the question was whether Saiku was open source. Yeah, and the second one is, is it kind of a replacement for the old JPEG? Yeah, kind of the, the second question is, is it a replacement for JPEG? Yeah, exactly. um, yeah, in a way it is. It's, uh, they actually just changed their name. I think they're now called Meteorite BI. It's a consultancy firm here in the UK. They started out with uh, building plugins for Pentaho dashboard, uh, C tools, CDA, CD, or all CD uh, acronyms. And they spun off a standalone, uh, really nice user interface that using Mondrian in the background inside their, uh, uh, their solution. And yeah, I, I really like their user interface and the, the, the elements that they're using in there. More questions? So everything was clear. That's good. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, how do you expect to um, have it put into like site for a web browser? So the, the question is, how do I expect input? 
into it. Um, I'm not actually expecting input into the this system as such, um, since that's all coming through the um, let's see, go back to maybe this slide. Does it come up? It's still in the background, is it? There it is. So we actually have a lot of uh, other systems in place um, here in an, in an asset management system where we uh, check out part of the database and give that to a contractor who does the, the inspections, the quality inspections into the field or in the field. And that data set actually gets checked in into the, the asset management system and get uh, pushed forward to the to the uh, data warehouse. Um, so the input is all coming from from those other uh, systems, and it's really a way of pulling all the the data from different sources together and presenting that in a, a structured way to the to the end users. Well, I have a question. Did you also check with uh, like the normal relational database and, and, and see if BI was faster or if it's just prettier interface? W what is your conclusion about that? Um, yeah, we, we looked at uh, building such dashboards with relational databases. But uh, the queries you'll need to build for that um, actually involve quite a lot of work. And the nice thing about putting it in a dimensional data model is that you get all the user interface drag and drop tools for free. And they just, as long as you model your data, you fit your data <laughs> in, in, in a dimensional data model, um, it just does its magic and pulls up those results really quickly. Okay. No more hands, I, I see. Well, thank you very much uh, for being here. And